everyone. It's great that you came to our seminar. So today we have a pleasure to have a talk by Alexandra Moliet from uh, Bristol. Uh, Alexandra, well, let's say did his PhD uh, in Bristol uh, just recently, okay? Uh, with uh, She was working before with, uh, okay, people involved a lot in quantum computing, so with uh, Ashley Montanaro, Noah Linden, and Peter Turner. Uh, well, let's say she focused on, uh, well, uh, classical simulation of uh, one of the paradigms for quantum advantage, namely boson sampling. And uh, yeah, just recently, uh, she, uh, well, just this week or last week, you started last week at <laughs> River Lane in, in Cambridge, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, probably without moving there physically, given the, the current conditions in the UK also. Right? Yeah, I'm still living in Bristol. Yeah, but uh, Alex won't be t telling, uh, telling us about her work in, with River Lane, but instead, uh, yeah, she will like convey probably like main findings of her PhD that concern like effects that partial distinguishability of photons and uh, uh, and losses uh, affect uh, classical, well, classical hardness of uh, boson cell. Okay, so the floor uh, is your, uh, yours, Alex. Thanks again for agreeing to give a talk. Thank you, Michael, for, for giving me the chance to give this talk. Um, like Michael was saying, I part, I, Michael was one of my examiners in my Viva literally two weeks ago. And this is the first talk I've given since becoming a doctor. So in all of that, I also came up with an alternative title for this talk, which is Dr. Moilet or Howland to Stop Worrying and Love the First Quantization. And I even came up with a nice graphical summary as well corresponding to this, where we've got the nice plain land of boson sampling and Major Kong dropping this bomb of near-term imperfections on it. On it. If any of you haven't seen Doctor Strange Love, I would highly recommend and doing so. And I apologize if you didn't get the reference. So I'm going to be talking about a couple of different results in my the thesis. Um, there are going to be two papers. What the first one on first, I'm going to introduce the use boson sampling and its imperfections. And then I'm going to talk about how we can model these imperfections in first quantization, and then how we can and use this model to come up with novel classical simulations. So let's start off by talking about quantum computing in jet enroll. And there are many great things about quantum computers, like we have found significant speed ups in problems such as debt computer security, in simulating physical systems, and machine in learning, though this one is a bit more questionable following the great results of Yuan Tang and others. And we also have polynomial speedups in many optimization and search problems. And one of the things that most excites me uh, personally about quantum computing is that we now have demonstration devices available. You can open up your laptop, go to IBM's website and program their quantum computer in their lab in New York. I think that's an amazing development to have achieved. The downside to quantum computers is that currently they're not useful. And what I mean by this is the largest quantum computer to date is 72 qubits. This is the Bristol-Kern chip, superconducting chip created by Google. But the number of actual qubits we need for one particular speed, speed up, in this case, a plot and Grover search to a NP hard problem is on the order of 10 to the 12 physical qubits. So we are nowhere near that kind of target yet. And even for more near term speedups, such as uh, simulation. Sorry, Alex, so this includes the error correction, yes? Uh, this this includes error correction, right. yes. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, this is, this is talking physical qubits here. And even there are more reasonable proposals put forward for not near some quantum computers, but currently they still need, currently um, they, such as simulating bit um, fertilizers in this paper, but even those still require on the order of a million qubits. And so we've got this kind of void and we're trying to, this leads to a sub kind of tension within the community at best summarized in memes, I feel, that have come out in the most recent years. So if we were to plot ourselves on a timeline, we currently are at the point where quantum computers are small, they're noisy, they're not better at solving problems for us. And eventually we want to be at the point where quantum computers are large, they're fault tolerant, and they're better at many, many th things. And what I'm interested in is the point in the middle where quantum computers demonstrate advantages in some areas. We want to find an area where quantum computers can start to demonstrate a benefit. And so I call this a quantum speed up personally. And what I mean by that is I want a problem which satisfies three properties. The first is it can be solved by a small noisy quantum computer, the kind of quantum computer we would expect to see in the next, say, three to five years. The second is that it cannot be feasibly solved by a regular computer. So by this I mean a classical computer, whether that's the laptop that I'm presenting on right now, or say the Summit supercomputer. And thirdly, ideally we want a problem that is useful as well. So it has some real world applications. It's not just a problem we are interested in because quantum computers might be able to do it better than classical computers. So that's the kind of motivation of what we're trying to do. Now I'm going to try and introduce boson sampling and how that fits into the picture. So to start with, let's talk about linear optics. So we're going to start off with this little line here, which it's going to represent an optical fiber. So this is just a path that a photon, a particle of light can travel through. We can introduce a partially reflective mirror called a beam splitter. So half the photon, so when a photon interacts with a beam splitter, half of it, there's a 50% probability that it goes through and a 50% probability that it reflects off. And a phase shifter, so this it is just a small component to adjust as the phase. This in linear, so for example, physically, this could represent a um, controlled heater that affects the refractive index of your fiber. So the canonical example, and a canonical example of the significance of linear optics is the Hong U Mandel dip, which, in which we have one of these 50 50 beam splitters. We put a pair of indistinguishable single photons on either side of its input modes, and we send those photons through the, inter through the beam splitter. Now, there are three possible ways that these photons could come out. They could both come out in the top hot path, they could both come out in the bottom path, or they could come out one in each part, one in each spatial mode. But the thing is that a beam split that introduces a pi, a pi over two phase shift to the photons. And so if we think about the four different possibilities, the four different paths that our photons could take, so they could both come out in the top, up path, they could both come out in the bottom path, they could both go through the beam splitter, or they could both reflect off. And crucially, these with these last two cases, either the output is the same, so these two, same, but 
the case where they're they both reflect off has a pi, pi phase shift in total. And so what happens is these two cases end up canceling out. This is kind of destructive interference. And we can see this physically in an experiment. So this is a res chart from Hong Yu Mandel's original paper where they demonstrate, they said that at the point where so that our uh, x-axis is kind of representing how identical our photons are, how indistinguishable they are, and that in turn affects how well the extent to which these two cases cancel each other out. And our y-axis represents the number of clicks we see where one photon has come out in each path. And as they tweak the position of their beam splitter to a point where the photons look identical, what we see is a drop or dip in the probability of the, this outcome. And this, is, this has led to the Hong Yu Mandel dip being the kind of canonical way in which we characterize uh, distinguishability between pairs of photons. So what's boson sampling then? Well, we start off with this kind of structures as I talked about before of beam splitters and a phase shifter. And we duplicated a bunch of times to create a number of paths in parallel. And we interweave them in this kind of way such that we are able to implement some linear optical interferometer in the, some unitary matrix in our interferometer. We then input indistinguishable single photons into this interferometer. And the question is, where do our photons come out on the other side? Now, this is a probabilistic question. They're going to come out in some random configuration according to some probability distribution. And so the question of boson sampling is, can we sample from that dis same distribution or approximately from the same distribution? So is boson sampling then an example of a quantum speedup? Well, it is easy for small quantum computers. And this is because boson sampling is in effect a quantum computer. It's not, it's not a universal quantum computer, so we can't implement the controlled not, a controlled not gate in the, this quantum computer, but it is using the laws of quantum physics to solve a very specific computational problem, in this case, the problem of boson sampling. So in principle, it is a, a problem that's easy to solve for small quantum computers. Is this hard for classical computers to solve? The answer to this is also true, yes, because of the key, this is the groundbreaking result of Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov nearly 10 years ago now, where they were able to reduce the hardness of sampling from this distribution to the hardness of computing. They're able to demonstrate, prove that sampling from this distribution must be hard, uh, hard but by a known result on the hardness of computing permanence of complex matrices. The link here being that the output, the probability of a certain outcome is can be written as the permanence of a matrix. And is it useful? So this is much more of a debatable point. We don't have a definitive benefit for boson sampling. We don't have a real world application for it. But there are interesting potential directions, such as this paper at the bottom here uses doesn't use single photons, but it uses Gaussian states, so another form of linear optical states, and an adaptive interferometer uh, to simulate the vibronics, the vibrational spectra of molecules. So there are potentially real world benefits as well in terms of simulating physical systems. Um, sorry, Alex, can I ask about this yeah. last point? So in, in that proposal, don't they uh, 
what is the structure of the outputs of uh, uh, from the interferometer? Because uh, let's say unless this output is very structured, you have many probabilities. Like, uh, and then it's uh, like I understand that some particular problem might be encoded in particular values of outcome probabilities, but then it's still like you need to repeat your experiment many times to estimate uh, those yeah. probabilities, right? Yeah, I can't remember the exact details of this paper, mm -hmm. but paper, I paper and they definitely, it's definitely not an instance of a problem that can't uh, be, there were certainly demonstrations on problem sizes which we can already simulate classically. Um, but, and, but yeah, you do need, my understanding is that you do need to take many sample balls and you're also, like I said, you're adapting your interferometer as you go. So you're doing that by tweaking these kind of phase shifters and in doing so for a combination of that and sampling, they're able to get at this, this kind of underlying structure of these molecules. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So there's a problem, however, with boson sampling, and that is that in order to demonstrate the speed up, we need a lot of photons. So to give reference, this is a graph from a paper by Alex Neville and others a couple of years ago, and what they were looking at is trying to classically simulate boson sampling. And they came up with this graph where this line here, line here is kind of the bet, uh, minimum of what we need in order to act, show any ben. So our x, sorry, so our bottom axis is um, the number of photons in our interferometer. Uh, vertical axis is the number, the probability of a single photon for each photon that it survives from the start of your interferometer to the end. So it isn't lost at any point. And they're assuming in this paper that if you lose any number of photons in your experiment, you just throw the experiment away and you just throw that run of your experiment away and start again. And if so, this is, and the heat map is the extent to which we see any speed up over classical computation. So this line here represents the point at which our quantum computer is actually, our boson sampling device is actually performing faster than the best supercomputer simulating boson sampling at all. These other two lines represent the point at which we, we actually see a, a, a significant speed up. So this first one, so this first one represents 10 orders of uh, the quant, the boson sampling device running 10 orders of magnitude faster than the classical supercomputer. And this line represents the boson sampling device solving a problem in a week, which a classical computer couldn't solve in a hundred years. And so the main conclusion from this is that if we need at least 30 photons in order to demonstrate a benefit against a single a student's laptop, in order to demonstrate any significant advantage, we need to at least be running more like 50 to 90 photons. And currently the best, at the time of publishing, the best photon experiment they had was six photons. We have now pushed that up to 10 photons in ideal boson sampling, or 20 photons if you induce a is six of your photons being lost. And so the point here is that we need to, in order to gain any kind of benefit, 
it's over classical the best classical simulators. We need to push our, push our experiments quite hard and scale up our number of sub photons quickly. But there's a problem with just so, scaling uh, up. Alex, Alex oh. can I just comment yeah, on sure. the previous thing? I mean, so, I mean, I agree that generally there is a consensus that what this paper did actually represents, like, let's say, fair classical simulation of, uh, of boson sampling, okay? But mm -hmm. uh, to be fair, like, they don't exactly, uh, they, uh, how to put it, they do like heuristic simulation, so they don't actually prove yeah. that what they are doing is correct, right? So up to some system sizes, they they kind of they, they prove it that it's that they have control that it's correct, but then they exp extrapolate, extrapolate, and then yeah, yeah. So just yeah. some uh, just to add some uh, opinion, like like if one is very let's say paranoid, then uh, let's say. Uh, it's like it's indication that it's uh, uh, that it's easy classically, okay, or easy enough classically, but it's not like per se true, right? Yeah. As far as I understand. Uh, yeah. Um, I will be talking a bit more in a bit more detail about this algorithm later, but yeah, okay. uh, as you rightfully put, was that so the way they ver they didn't formally verify the correctness of this algorithm. What they did instead was they ran us and checks us against um, a hypothesis tester so the kind of the same approach that we use for currently ver verifying current boson sampling experiments at elements and show that this passes that say a, this simulator passed the same test but yeah it's a good point to raise um, but there's an issue so there's an issue with just scaling up the number of photons in your experiments, which is that you naturally end up encountering imperfections with that. And there are two experimental imperfections I'm going to talk about in particular. So the first one is distinguishability. And when I talk about these, ex these imperfections in person, I normally have this nice fun demonstration, which some of you may have seen before. But we're not in person right now, so I've decided to use the magic of pre-recorded video for this next bit. So in my hands, there are three juggling balls. These represent our three photons, and these photons are all red right now. So that means that they are indistinguishable from one another. And so I can permute them in some way AI like, and it is impossible for you to tell at the end that I have permuted them in this way. And so this makes it, this increases the kind of classical hardness of boson sampling as you've got to consider a lot more different possible, possible routes. There's a many more different ways that our photons could interfere with one another. However, if our photons are distinguishable, so, so it's in this video where they are all different colors, it's much more easier to uniquely identify each photon and we can, it's much easier to tell as a result how they must have been permuted through the, how they must have traveled through our system. And so you can easily classically sit, makes it, that makes it easier to classically simulate. The other imperfection I look at is photon loss, which also has a nice juggling analogy, which is simply put, we start out with more photons than we have at the finish. So those are the two imperfections I am going to talk, talk about today. So now I'm going to talk about how we can model these imperfections. So the way we can do this, there are two different ways that we often think about quantum and computing and, quant and linear optics. The first way that we look at the, them is what's called the second quantization. So this is where we record 
how many photons are in each spatial mode or fiber at a point given during our evolution of the system. And this is good for modeling linear optics because as our we can't uniquely identify our photons. And so it makes more sense physically to rather keep track back of the rather identify each spatial mode or fiber instead. The other way that we can picture them is the first quantization. In this setting, we instead keep track of each, each individual photon and we're tracking what optical, what spatial mode that photon is in. And the benefits of this form is that it's good for modeling errors. This is, since it's the kind of standard way that we picture, picture errors evolving in quantum, it's the standard way that we model quantum circuits and it is therefore good. And we have quite a lot of literature around how to, around how errors evolve in quantum circuits and how we can correct for those errors. So what, what we want to do is we want to translate the kind of errors that appear in linear optics and optics into errors in the first quantization. So to do this, we need to understand how first quantization works. So first of all, we have each of our particles here are in, re represented by a qubit, so a d-dimensional dimensional particle, and where d is the number of spatial modes in our system. So in this case, our first qubit, our first photon is in spatial mode one, our second one is in spatial mode two. We then apply the Young symmetry, a Young symmetrizer to the, these particles. So this is to project us into the symmetric subspace of this Hilbert space. So for example, for our two photon case here, it generates the kind of standard Bell state, eight. So we've got one, two, and then we permute them. And this can be implemented in polynomial time thanks to the quant on some short transform. After we've generated this symmetrized state, we need to act our interferometer on it. So this is done through these this interferometer hit through this as a local unitary U. So this is a this is, U is M by M, so it's a unitary matrix for representing of size number of spatial modes in our system. And we just act on that on each particle locally. So how do we, so now we want to model these imperfections in our, our first quantization setup. So for distinguishability, this translates to having an external environment acting on our system. So now we don't just record what spatial mode our photons are in, but also their kind of internal state or their spectral, spectral information. And so in this case, this corresponds to our photon in mode one, spatial mode one is a red photon, and our photon in spatial mode two is a blue photon. And we symmetrize over this larger space of both spatial and spectral modes. We then use a result for our, known as the unitary, unitary duality to separate this out into set, separate register, to separate this out into um, one register for our spatial modes and another for our spectral modes. So that's what's demonstrated here. And then we trace out 
any distinct, we trace out our spectral mode, so we lose the information associated with that, associated with um, the internal state of our photons, photons, and then we apply unitary and X and take a measurement as before. The other imperfection we have, photon Alex, loss. Can I, can yeah. I uh, have, a, uh, have a question? This distinguishability, um, so in the experiment, how, of course, in the, in the balls, you, you had like the, the, the colors to differentiate yeah. the balls. Uh, but in the experiment, I, I got a little bit lost. How can, they, can one distinguish this? In the, in so, the actual experiment. So, yeah, so we're not, so distinguishability, I often talk about colors just because it's a more, intuit, more visually intuitive way of distinguishing photons. Other ways that they can be distinguished as well include polarization or what time they're generated. So off, this kind of standard way we have of generating photons in a lab is through, um, probabilistic methods such as um, it's just that my spontaneous parametric down conversion version or SPDC and this is a probabilistic me method so you won't so you might get it so if you've got one source generating a pet generating your photons and another source generating your photons, they might fire at different times. So that's another way. So that's a kind of more critical way in which our photons might distinct, be distinguishable. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you. No worries. So if I can just comment, so maybe as yeah. far as I understand, the, the, the point is that you, in actual expert, uh, you know, if those photons are not perfectly indistinguishable, uh, like, and you put them through the chip, uh, this machine, like this, let's say, particle number detector that is insensitive to, let's say, um, to the color of photons, would uh, effectively see like partial trace over those like uh, colored uh, internal degrees of freedom, right? Yeah. So, uh, from the point of view of experiment, uh, effectively it would be like as if those photons were just distinguishable. Uh, I, I, do I understand well? Yeah. 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 So you actually don't like the, the whole point is that you don't sort of you you don't see those internal degrees of freedom, but effectively because the photons like the, they were not perfectly distinguishable, the, the whole system behaves as if they were like not no funny thing in the statistics government. Yeah, so we're assuming that you can't. So there are ways in which you can measure measure out. You can determine what time in the photon was generated or what polarization it is. But we're for the sake of boson sampling, we're assuming for the sake of this work, we are assuming that you are simply measuring um, your what spatial mode the photon is in. And so you're losing all of this information that's stored in the kind of um, internal degree of freedom, ease of freedom. So if I can ask, if you had the ability to unravel this internal degree of freedom, would uh, you would be able to like go back to the standard boson sampling setting? Or to um, you, you can get back to something that's similar to it. So there's this area of research called multi boson called multi-boson correlation sampling, where Whoa. they are able to effectively, my understanding is that by measuring in a kind of ortho, like an all degree of freedom to, if your photons are distinguishable and say their frequency, you can measure in terms of another degree of freedom and that kind of jet, generates the set and kind of hardness results as boson as standard boson sampling. So you need to do a few more tricks, but you can work 
uh, Karanda, if you're able to measure these internal degrees of freedom. Thanks. No worries. So the other imperfection like action that I mentioned earlier is photon loss. And so this one can also be modeled pretty easily in first quantization, where the idea is that you start at, out in a larger Hilbert, in a symmetric subspace of a larger Hilbert space of n plus k photons now. And you simply trace out the, par the particles which are lost in your experiment. And a key detail here is that because the because we have applied our symmetrizer before and we're only working in the symmetric subspace, it doesn't matter which specific particles are lost, as we just trace out a subset of them. So in this case, we are we choose one of our photons to survive and the other to be lost, and we trace out the lost one. So that's kind of how we model these imperfections in first quantization. And now I'm going to talk about how we apply that, those models to a specific form of distinguishability and loss, and how that leads to a classical simulation. So before we do this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of current method, the kind of current methodologies for simulating boson sampling and these imperfections. So the first one I'm going to mention is a cut the kind of original way of simulating boson sampling, ideal boson sampling, which is this result by Alex Neville before, where you start out with the foot with trying to simulate fully distinguishable boson sampling. And crucially, this can be done in polynomial time, time because we can simply run each photon through the interferometer individually. And we can also compute the probability of an outcome in polynomial time up to some, um, some degree of error. And so uh, we start with this original distribution, and then we use a technique called metropolized independent sampling to reweight the probabilities of different outcomes. And we run this process many, many times. And eventually, we get to a point where we decide that our distribution is close enough to the idealized one. So this is an approximate algorithm. We, it's not, there aren't really known bounds for it. The way, like I said earlier, the way they kind of verified the correctness of this algorithm was to run it on a 30, 30 photon instance. And they were able to show that if they ran it long enough, it passed the same kind of verification tests that we current, use for current boson sampling experiments. That another potential issue with it is that there are potentially many permanent ones required for uh, to classically apply the simulator. So I think for the original paper, they used something on the order of 200 permanents. permanents. So that was the kind of original way of doing it. And then another way was proposed by Peter and Raphael Clifford shortly afterwards, where what they do is they start out by sampling a single photon and run it, simulating that as it goes through the experiment. And then our second photon, we simulate that one going through our experiment, conditioned on um, where the first photon came out. So, so we run one photon through the experiment. We then run two photons through the experiment, conditioned on we know where the first where one of those photons came out. And then we do this for three photons, four photons, and we carry on up to the point 
where we've got all of our photons run through the experiment. And nice properties of this algorithm is that it's an exact algorithm for classically simulating boson sampling. The asymptote, when they looked at the performance of this, they, Clifford and Clifford were able to demonstrate that in the worst case, you only need to need computational effort equivalent to computing two permanents plus a small amount of pop, pop plus a polynomial overhead. And, and very exciting results they've shown more recently is that this algorithm can in fact achieve an even better runtime in practice for certain settings, such as if you've got a rat par random interferometer and depending on your number of photons and number of spatial modes. So, so you're, referring kind of, to the, you're referring to the paper from two days ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that's the more recent paper. So those are the kind of classical algorithms for exactly simulating boson sampling. I'm now going to talk about the specific model of distinguishability that we use in this paper, which was introduced by another result by Renemer and others. And under this model, each photon in our experiment is either in a kind of subset of fully indistinguishable photons, so photons which are fully indistinguishable from each other, or that photon is fully distinguishable from every other photon. So with our two photon example here, this photon is either red or blue, and this photon is either red or yellow. And we have a parameter x, which represents the probability of each of a photon being indis indistinguishable. And what Randomer and others showed using an earlier uh, result is that the, the probability distribution is equal to this summa summation here, where we've got this sum increasing with x to the j and we're computing some sum of different permanents here. And so the idea that Renema and others had was to truncate this probability distribution. So let's say we're going to cut out, out uh, we're going to not compute this matrix here where with our coefficient being growing as x squared. And the idea behind this is that, that we can break, take this large sum of permanents down into a sum of different permanents which are hard, but the matrix is going to be small. It's going to be at most k, k a, where k is our level of truncation, and that multiplied by this other matrix, which is a positive matrix and is therefore easy to approximate. And so we're able to approximate this probability up to some degree k, and we then have to apply some corrections because of this approximation. So it might be because we're not computing the full probability that some of these probabilities are and approximated as being less than zero. But we correct that by just rounding it up, rounding those probabilities up to zero. And at that point, we've got a valid probability distribution. And then we apply metropolized independent sampling to this approximate distribution and in doing so we are able to get a sample and 
crucially, what random and others showed from this is that the average error can be bounded as this as being at most this value here, which crucially only depends on x our indistinguishability between our photons and k our level of truncation. It does not depend on the number of photons in our system. And so as a result, the largest um, hard to compute permanent that we need to compute is at most k by k. And we only need to, we need to compute quite a, quite a few of them, but as lot, but we can choose k to be just a constant or a value dependent on x and our degree of, of error, epsilon. And so this is crucially pot ends up being polynomial top. The number of permanents we need to compute is polynomial. And therefore we can get at a polynomial time algorithm for this approximation. The downside is that this algorithm could be quite lot as inefficient in practice. That access if k is quite large, then if k is large, then n to the 2k will be quite a large polynomial, even though it is a polynomial. And the other downside is that we only have an average case error bound for a random unitary interferometer. We don't have a worst case error bound. And if there's a loss of structure to your interferometer, then the approximation could have quite a significant error behind it. And another, another thing is that, another minor point is that this algorithm assumes that the output, it, that your photons always are, are coincident incidents at the output. So this it means that there's only at most one photon in each spatial mode at the output, which is a minor thing, doesn't really affect boson sampling that much, but worth noting. So question is, can we improve this then? And the, ideally, one way we would like to improve this is to use Clifford and Clifford rather than this metropolized independence sampling. But the problem lies with the fact that we have these negative probabilities, which we don't know how to correct for. And so we need to find an, find a workaround for, for this. So can we rewrite this model then in order to avoid having to compute these negative probabilities then? This was the question we had when thinking about this work. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to decompose our probability distribution into a distribution of different boson sampling experiments. So in our first experiment, both of our photons are not in this fully indistinguishable subset. They are both fully distinguishable. Then our second experiment, one of our photons is in the fully indistinguishable subset. And in our sec third experiment, both of our photons are in the fully indistinguishable subset. And what we're able to show using our first quantization techniques from before is that the probability of seeing one of these experiments is equal to the binomial distribution. So uh, in effect, we've got one coin for each photon and the probability of this coin landing on heads is x. We flip each coin in turn and then the number of heads we have after our, all of our coin flips is the number of indistinguishable photons in our experiment. So this then leads us to a classical simulation algorithm as well, where rather than truncating our, in our approximation of this probabilities, we're going to truncate the maximum number of indistinguishable photons in our experiment. So we're going to first choose our subset of indistinguishable photons from this binomial distribution. And we're going to choose it in a truncated way. So we're going to throw out the 
kind of experiments where the, the most number of indistinguishable photons exist. So in this case, for our two first on example, we're going to say for the case where both of our photons are in this indistinguishable set. We then, once we have our sample of indistinguishable photons, we can simulate those using the Clifford and Clifford algorithm from before. And the remaining distinguishable photons can be simulated classically by just running each one through the interferometer in turn. And we're able to show that for any interferometer, the error can be bounded as the tail end of the binomial distribution from our level of truncation. And this can be shown to be reduced to a small error if k, our level of truncation, is at least the average number, is greater than the average number of photons in our experiment. And it's worth noting we can do the same analysis for loss. So now each photon survives with probability eta. And this model can also follow, this uniform loss model can also follow the binomial distribution. And we can combine it with distinguishability as well. So now if less than k a photon survive, we can simulate all of the those surviving photons. Otherwise, if more than k photons survive, then we choose our indistinguishable subset, subset such that only at most k of them are indistinguishable. And the probability distribution again follows this conditional binomial, follows this binomial distribution, where now rather than just having x here, we've got eta times x. It, as our binomial coefficient. So the benefits of this algorithm are now we have worst case error bounds and we only require computational efforts relate equivalent to two k by k permanents plus a small polynomial overhead. The downside is that now our error bound and our level of truncation is dependent on the number of photons. And so Asymptotically, we have an exponential runtime in terms of the number of photons in our system. But do we get a speed up in practice over this? Can we show a benefit to this algorithm in practice, even at access for kind of near term experiments, even if we can't show one asymptotically? Um, so, Alex, can I ask yep. something? So, do I understand? Well, so what? So you you predetermine k this uh, this number k in advance, right? So you say that okay, I'm yeah. um, I'm not going to compute permanents that have si uh, size uh, greater uh, matrices that have size greater than I know twenty or something, and then that fixes you, let's say k, and then. As you consider this decomposition of the, this whole experiment onto a bunch of like different uh, boson sampling experiments, like if, if you sample, assume that you sample binomially and you happen to get k that is larger than this threshold k, you just throw this away. You don't do anything there. Or how does yeah. it work? So the way we do this kind of sampling for us is that um, what we can do is we can work out the probability distribution, the binomial distribution for up from zero up to K. And then once we've worked it out the distribution at that point, we just renormalize mm -hmm. and then we take a sample over that range. Okay. All right. So we did a whole bunch of analysis. I'm going to quickly go through this because I'm aware of the time. So if we compare these two different approaches when we're truncating them at the same level of k, then what we can see is that our x-axis is our vertical x, horizontal axis is the number of photons in our experiment, and our vertical axis is the maximum distinguishability and the maximum loss that these two approaches can simulate at that level of truncation. And 
we check here's the truncation based on the number of photons in our experiment. And what we find is that the dashed lines are this technique by Renema and others, and the solid lines are our new technique. And if we simulate them at the same level of truncation, then Renema's technique is significantly better than ours, ours for all experiments. But if we consider run the runtime of these experiments as well, so this is our kind of approximated runtime for our experiments, and under fixed levels of distinguishability and loss, our algorithm um, is significantly better. So even for these green line lines here, which represent a really bad experiment where half of your photons are distinguishable and half of your photons are lost, we see our algorithm performing better for 200 plus photons. And for, um, I, for more ideal experiments, such as the red lines here, our algorithm is performing better for solving this problem faster for up to 400 plus, for up to 400 photons. And for reference, the number of computational operations a classical supercomputer can do in an hour right now is about 10 to the 20. So this line here and 50 to 90 photons is kind of the range that we expect to simulate. So we are performing significantly better across that range. I'm, the last bit of analysis we did is performance at 90 photons, which photons. So the idea behind this experiment, this analysis is that we have fixed the number of photons as being 90. We are choosing k, we are varying k along our vertical axis, our, our horizontal axis, sorry. Our vertical axis is our highest value of distinguishability or loss that we can simulate. And the blue line is our new algorithm, the algorithm. The orange line, the green line is um, Renema's algorithm at truncation point K, truncated at degree K. And the orange line is Renema's algorithm with the condition that it must run at, in the set, hey, it must not be significantly slower than our algorithm. And what we're able to show in this setting is that we are able to achieve that we're able to simulate higher values of distinguishability for at truncation levels of about 45 photons and higher level performance, higher levels of loss we can simulate as about 20 or so for photons. And crucially, these are within the range that we can, we believe can be classically simulated. These are the levels of truncation that we expect can be classically simulated. And so while our algorithm does not offer a benefit asymptotically, we give this as reasoning that for more near term regimes, our algorithm can be beneficial. I, I did, we did some analysis on non-uniform loss as well. I'm going to kind of very briefly skip over this effectively we can translate non-uniform loss where each component experiences some amount of loss into a layer of uniform loss and then apply the same techniques from before. Um, and so I'm just going to finish off by quickly talking through some interesting directions for what's next. The main big caveat here is that the honest answer for me is my current job. So, up, so I'm not really working on this stuff anymore, but for if people are interested in working on it, some interesting directions include trying to consider other imperfections in linear optics, as well as other models of distinguishability and loss. So 
other imperfections might include dark counts or, spec or photon purity. Another question is what happens, can we extend these algorithms or other classical boson sampling algorithms, which I haven't had the time to mention, to other linear optical regimes, such as Gaussian boson sampling, or linear optics with adaptive measurements or measurement-based linear optical quantum computing, so adapting them to universe, simulate universal linear optical quantum computing. And can we improve these classical simulations even further and come up with more optimal algorithms? So just to quickly summarize then, distinguishability and loss need to be strongly considered with boson sampling experiments because classical simulation people will take advantage of these imperfections. We, it's good to look at asymptotic runtimes, but we also need to look at how these runtimes will play out in practice if we're going to compare quantum versus classical computation. And finally, experimentalists still have quite a ways to go if they want to beat classical simulations. So that's everything I've got to say. I'd like to thank my collaborators, Raul Garcia Patron at the University of Edinburgh, Yelma Renema at University of Twente, and my former supervisor, Peter Turner, at the University of Bristol. These are the wonderful people who supported me for the last one and a half years, and these are the two papers, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Yes. So. Uh, uh, now we have time for questions, comments to the speaker. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I maybe have one question. So this, uh, okay, this uh, partial distinguishability of photons, experimentally, is there a way to, to probe this uh, like degree of distinguishability across different photons. Do people across like different modes, let's say, do people do something like this experimentally? So yeah, this is um, what people used to ho hung and mandled it for, um, is to kind of characterize. So the way we often then characterize when we develop a new but new chip, photonics chip. The way we'll characterize this is by sending photons through, generating photons in different spatial modes and applying a Hongu Mandel interferometer to, the, to them and measuring the different visibility, the extent to which we can see this dip mm -hmm. in coincidences. And that corresponds to the that corresponds to both the distinguishability of your photons and also the pure, spectral purity of them. Mm -hmm. But it's like just uh, like probing across two modes, right? Uh, yeah. Not like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so do you mean probing across like? So do you mean probing across more than two modes, or do you mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this has this. It's less concrete what kind of experiments you can run, and for of this, but there has been some interest in it. So. Um, Alex Jones, who used to be at the University of Oxford and is now at the University of Bristol, has done, done some work, work on this. And one of my former colleagues, Stasia Stanisic, has also done some work on um, theoret developing theoretical interferometers, which are better, which are able to discriminate multi photon distinguishability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. across multiple modes. Sure. So I just maybe comment, like there is some, some work by Ernesto Galvao and Daniel Broad. It turns out that you can like, if you can access like pairwise like overlaps of, of states, like you can, you can sort of use it to even if you don't measure some overlaps, you can measure them uh, uh, or estimate them indirectly, at least. So this is okay. some 
uh, yeah, I just it just came to my mind now that okay, this is actually the motivation what they why uh, this photonic photonics was the motivation what why they did their work. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions to Alex? Okay, then what are you going to do in Riverlane if I can ask? <laughs> or is it so, secret? So, uh, I mean, we. So the main thing is we've got these two pro. We've got these two projects that we work on at Riverlane. So one is this. System. One is called Delta Flow, which is a cut, which is in collaboration with different hot hardware kit manufacturers to put, make it easier to make it more make us able to put faster algorithms onto quantum hardware and the other is Anion which is a library of di different quantum algorithms for quantum chemistry on noisy intermediate scale qu mm -hmm. quantum computers so NISC um, devices mm -hmm. and currently since I'm a new employee I'm kind of just working a little bit across both of these projects and trying to get familiar with them sure sure but this this choice of the name is okay i mean onion okay it's, it's chemistry also because for me onion also like there are those exotic particles <laughs> okay <laughs> all right yeah uh, i don't know where the naming conventions came from <laughs> okay okay so you guys can see that you know, uh, studying quantum computing like doesn't only give you a job in academia, but you can also go to industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This has been quite an exciting development of like the last couple of years, in my opinion, is seeing the sudden rise in industry interest. Okay, last chance to ask something to Alex. Right. Okay. So, given that there were already quite some questions during the talk, uh, mm -hmm. so I think. Uh, and we should thank Alex again for her time and like willing to share us uh, share with us those nice findings. Thanks, thanks again. Thank you.